It's finally happened. We have a new release of Slackware. Slackware just announced yesterday version 15.0 is now released. This is the first stable version of Slackware to be released in six years. So that's one of the reasons why this is a very important topic that I wanted to cover today. The other reason this is important is because Slackware is the oldest active Linux distribution around. Slackware started in 1993, 29 years ago, right? And Slackware, because it's really kind of like the grandfather of all the other Linux distributions, or at least, you know, it precedes all the other Linux distributions that you guys use. I think it's important just from a historical perspective. I, I think everyone should at least know what Slackware is, especially if you're a Linux enthusiast. It's good to know a little bit about this project. So let me pull up my web browser and read a little bit of the release announcement. So this was yesterday, February 2nd. February 2nd is a holiday here in the U.S. known as Groundhog Day. It's where uh, we have a tradition here in the U.S. where on February 2nd, they pull a, a groundhog out of his den and if the groundhog sees his shadow becomes scared of his own shadow then it means we're going to have six more weeks of winter if he doesn't see a shadow it means we're in for early spring this year i'm actually not sure what the groundhog saw yesterday i just i didn't realize it was actually groundhog day until reading this announcement because they reference it here in the announcement they write well folks in spite of the dire predictions of youtube pundits i'm not sure what they're talking about there Prediction number eight for 2022 is Slackware still will not see a new release. It's been, what, five, six years since the last release of Slackware. We're not going to get one in 2022 either. In spite of the dire predictions of the YouTube pundits, this morning the Slack Hog emerged from its development den and did not see its shadow, and Slackware 15.0 has been officially released. Another six weeks, or six years, of the development treadmill averted. So it's just a, a play on the whole Groundhog Day uh, holiday here in the U.S. Now one interesting thing is they mentioned some of the changes. Of course a lot has changed in Linux in six years, right? <laughs> Massive changes. So they've updated the desktop environment today I'm going to take a look at the uh, KDE Plasma desktop environment because that was always one of the big complaints with Slackware in the past is they were shipping with a version of KDE that was not even version 5 Plasma. They were shipping the old KDE 4. It was one of the 4 series, I think 4.12 or you know, it was a KDE desktop that nobody really liked. <laughs> they were stuck on that thing for six years. And now we have KDE version 5.23.5, which is the Plasma 25th anniversary edition. They've also added support for Pipewire. I don't think it's installed by default, but if you want to, you can enable Pipewire. They've also switched from Console Kit 2 to eLogND. And that's very important because having eLogin D, which is part of the System D suite of applications, they don't use System D as an init system. They're still using their own custom init system that was based off of the old uh, Sys5 init system. But anyway, they have eLogin D now installed, which makes it much easier to support software that has hard dependencies on system d i don't want to spend too much time on the release notes here i'll link to the release announcement in the show description if you guys want to read the whole thing i'm going to go ahead and download the iso and i'm going to install slackware 15.0 with the kde plasma desktop environment inside a virtual machine and let's take a look around all right, I went ahead and downloaded the Slackware DVD ISO, and this is again version 15.0, their latest stable version, and we get a prompt as soon as you boot into the, the environment here. We have boot colon and then just a blinking prompt, and this is where we could add some extra kernel parameters if we need to boot with some extra kernel parameters. Most people are not going to need to, so it says... We could press F2 to see those kernel choices. We could just wait two minutes and it will automatically just boot for us. Or I could just hit enter right now and go ahead and boot it without any extra parameters. And now we need to select our keyboard settings. By default, it's set to US keyboard, which is correct for me, so I don't need to do anything. If you need to, it says please enter one now and where you could uh, find your particular keyboard settings. I'm just gonna hit enter. And now we get to a login prompt. It says you may now log in as root, but before you log in as root, I would read uh, the information here because it says you're gonna need one or more partitions of type Linux prepared. So what you're gonna need to do, you're going to need to when you log in as root 
with a command line program such as F disk or CF disk or parted, you're going to need to partition your drive. So not everybody will be comfortable with this, but it's not that hard. I'm going to use F disk today to show you how to partition your drive using that particular program. And then after you're done with that, uh, you exit F disk and then you type the word setup to begin the Slackware installation. So remember that setup. So let's go ahead and log in as root. So just type root as the username. There's no password for root. It just automatically lets you in. And then we get a warning here that says you need to partition your drives using CF disk or F disk. That's nice that they actually mentioned the names of the programs. So I'm going to do F disk. And if I do F disk space dash L for list, that should list all of the devices, all of the drives on my system, which in this virtual machine should just be one virtual hard drive slash dev slash VDA in my case. So what I need to do now that I know the name of the drive, I'm going to install this to I'm going to do F disk space slash dev slash VDA. And now we're inside F disk. The prompts now are actually inside the F disk program. It says M for help. So if you type M, you get a list of all the commands within F disk. Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to create a new partition table. Now, you can either create a GPT partition table if you're doing UEFI, which most people are going to want to do, especially on physical equipment, or you can do a DOS partition table, which is the old master boot record, which is what I'm going to do here inside this virtual machine because this virtual machine is actually not set up to use UEFI. So I'm going to type O on the keyboard to do a DOS partition table. If you're doing GPT, type G on the keyboard, then hit enter. And now that we've done that, let's create a new partition. So N on the keyboard creates a new partition. I'm going to create two partitions. I'm going to do a swap and then an extend for file system. So it says, what kind of partition type do we want to create here? P for primary is what I want. Partition number one through four, because I'm doing master boot record, I have one through four as an option. GPT, you guys are going to have one through 128 as an option. So I could either type one here or just hit enter because the default is one because we haven't done anything. Yeah, it's going to go in order one, two, three, four. Then it's going to ask about the sector, the first sector on the disk. By default, it's going to do 2048. Just hit enter here. And then it's going to ask about the uh, last sector. Let me move my head here. Now what you want to do here is specify plus and then the size of the swap. And I'm going to do just a one gig swap because I don't really need a swap in this VM. I'm just doing this to demonstrate how to create a swap. On physical hardware, you may want to do a more substantial number like four gigs or even eight gigs of swap. So I'm going to do a one gig swap here and we've created that first partition. Now I'm going to type in again to create a new partition. Uh, P for primary once again. The partition number by default is two, that's okay. The first sector, just go with the default. And then the last sector, you could specify a size if you were creating more partitions after this. I'm not though, this is the only partition I'm creating. Uh, so I'm just going to hit enter again to give the entire rest of the disk to the second partition. Now by default, F disk creates the partitions as type Linux, meaning a Linux file system, which is correct for partition two that we created, the big partition, but it's not correct for the first partition, which is the swap partition. So let me hit M for help, and let me see how to change the partition type. It's T on the keyboard, so let me hit T. It's going to ask which partition do we want to change. I need to change partition one because by default it's going to be set to Linux, but I want to set it to swap. And I'm going to type capital L to list all the available partition types. And the most common ones they have at the bottom, you see Linux is the default. It's number 83. Swap is uh, number 82. So that's the one I want. So let me type 82 and hit enter. And that's it. We've partitioned the drive. Now we can just write and exit. If you type M to get the list of commands again, you will see that to save and exit is W on the keyboard. So type W, hit enter, and you're back to the root prompt. And now we can go ahead and run through the installation. So remember the word to type to run through the Slackware installer. It was setup. So let's go ahead and run that. All right, and then we have help information. If you want to read the help information, I'm just going to skip that. We have key map, and by default, it's set to US. I, I'm a US keyboard user, so I'm fine with that. But if you guys need to change it, you would hit OK here. Now, the third option, add swap. If you didn't create a swap partition, this option may or may not be here. But for me, I did create a swap partition, so I need to actually hit Enter here and tell it exactly 
uh, where the swap partition is. Now, I created two partitions on VDA. VDA1, which is the swap, and VDA2, which is the big partition. So I'm going to tell it to do slash dev slash VDA1 as the swap partition, which it figured that out on its own. So I actually didn't have to manually go in and choose everything. It already knows which partition probably should be the swap. So all I need to do is hit OK. Do I want to check that swap partition for bad blocks? Do I want to do a check for any kind of bad blocks on the device? that is time consuming and it's almost never really needed so I'll skip it for some reason you want to run it choose yes but I'm gonna choose no which is the default then we get this little confirmation screen letting us know it's gonna write the following information to slash Etsy slash FS tab which is the file system table so it's a file on your system that tells your Linux system all about your partitions of what file type they are where the mount points are and things like that all of this looks good just hit OK and then we need to tell it which partition is actually going to be our Linux file system, which of course is the only other partition slash VDA2 in my case. So I'm just going to select that. And then it's going to ask, do I want to go ahead and format it or do I want to check for bad blocks on this disk? Again, I don't need to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and format that drive. And before it formats the drive, it needs to know what file system to put on that drive. By default, it's going to do extend for. That's typically what I go with. But you have other options. Some common options that you may choose other than extend for would include ButterFS. It's very popular these days. XFS has always been a, a Linux standard as well, known for stability. I'm going to do extend for, though. Hit OK. Once again, it's going to tell me what it's going to write to the slash Etsy slash FS tab. And now the final part of the installation, uh, it says, please select the media from which to install Slackware from. So uh, obviously I downloaded the DVD.ISO and I attached it to this virtual machine, essentially like inserting a DVD into an optical drive. So I'm going to choose number one. If you guys are installing from a different form of media, you would choose one of the other options here. But for me, the very first option is correct. So I'm going to hit enter and it's going to say, hey, it's scanning for CD or DVD drives. Yeah, just let it automatically scan your system for an optical drive. And it found the drive. Now it's going to ask about categories of software to install. And uh, there's a lot of stuff ticked on by default. If you want to tick some of this off, you can. For example, I know I'm going to install the KDE Plasma desktop, which is ticked on. But it also has XFCE installed. I'm going to go ahead and do the space bar there to tick that off. I don't need two different desktop environments. That's just a little bit too much bloat for my taste. But the rest of it, I'll leave ticked on. They have GNU Emacs ticked on by default. Way to go, Slackware guys. We even have some games that are going to be installed as well. Okay, well, let me go with that and then select the prompting mode. So, you know, what kind of information is going to get outputted on the screen while the installer is running, while it's installing all of those packages? Do we want full, which installs everything? And that is recommended. Do we want terse, which is like full, but it displays one line per package during installation? I'll probably go with that. Really, I don't think it matters too much what you choose here. You see, full terse display installation mode, a one-line description will be displayed as each package is installed, which is a, a lot cleaner to me. Right, just one line. I don't need a bajillion lines of output on the screen. I know some people like it. You know, they like a, a million things being spit out on the screen. For me, though, I don't need to see a, a lot of that superfluous information. Just to tell me what got installed and when it's complete. Now this portion of the installer is probably going to take 20 minutes maybe in this virtual machine I created. Now the Slackware guides tell you this typically will take between 15 and 45 minutes depending on your hardware. So I'm going to pause the video for a little while. I'll be back once the installation has completed. When oh, I stepped away for about 15 minutes to grab me a cup of coffee and it looks like it finished installing all the software. Okay, and now we're at this screen where we can make a USB flash boot stick. Now I'm gonna skip that. Uh, for those of you that want to create a USB boot stick, of course you would choose create. I'm gonna skip it though. Now we want to install Lilo. This is a bootloader. It's a, an alternative to Grub, essentially. Now, do you want to do the simple installation, which is try to install Lilo automatically? That's what I'm going to do. Expert 
is a uh, more hands-on configuration setup and then we could skip meaning don't install the bootloader uh, you would need to really know what you're doing if you're going to skip installing the bootloader i'm going to do this simple installation now it wants us to configure the frame buffer console so what kind of a resolution i want the biggest one possible just for purposes of recording any kind of output in this virtual machine for this video so i'll choose uh, the biggest resolution available do we want to add any any kernel parameters uh, nope I don't think I'm gonna need any so I'm just gonna skip that step so I'll leave it blank and hit enter now where do we want to install the bootloader now you can install it to uh, root install to super block now that is not available if you chose XFS for your file system but we chose extend for we could also install the bootloader to a floppy disk <laughs> or you could install it to the master boot record and that's what I'm gonna do now it's asking about GPM configuration. Now this is a program that allows you to cut and paste text inside your virtual consoles using your mouse. Uh, do I want to install that at boot time? Sure, why not? And would you like to configure your network? Yes, I'm going to need internet, so I'm going to choose yes for that. Enter a host name for your computer. I'm going to call this particular computer, I'm going to call it Slack Vert. Slack, we're a virtual machine, uh, just so it has a unique host name in case I ever have to SSH into this virtual machine, I'll know exactly which virtual machine I'm logging into, right? It's obviously Slackware. Now we need to enter a domain for Slackvert. Uh, it could be any domain, obviously. If it's not going to be a web server or anything. Just put anything. I'll put domain.com. And then connect via VLAN. Some advanced networking setups require a VLAN ID in order to connect to the network. We're not going to need that. By default, it's selected as no. I'm going to choose no. And then the configuration type for this computer as far as how we're connecting to the network. Uh, most people are probably going to want to do network manager, which is the default. That's dead simple. You just hit OK. It's probably going to detect everything automatically for you. DHCP is another very popular one. One. Some of the others that are available here are a little bit more niche and more advanced. I'm going to go with the default network manager. It wants to confirm, are we really going to set up the, uh, the network with network manager? Yes. And hit OK. And now we need to confirm our startup services. So what services get started, you know, when, by the init system when we boot up. Um, They've got several things turned on by default. One thing they don't have turned on is the CUPS print server. So if you have a printer attached to your computer, you probably want to go ahead and make sure that the, the CUPS server is launched. Um, HTTPD, that would be important if you wanted to have your Slackware installation be a web server. This is not going to be a web server. Uh, MySQL is also here. Some other server stuff. Uh, Samba. I don't need any of that. Mainly, I want to make sure SSH is installed and started as a startup service because I may SSH into this virtual machine on occasion. Sometimes I have the need for that. It is already turned on by default. So I'm just going to hit OK on these services. And then console font configuration. Would you like to try some custom screen fonts? Yeah, I don't really care what the console font is, so I'll skip that. Hardware clock set to UTC. By default, it's set to no, and that's the default with most computers. So I'm just going to go with that. And then I'm going to do US slash central for my time zone configuration. And then it's going to ask about a default text editor. And I love the fact that they offer Vim as an option because if many uh, Linux systems, if they don't install Vim by default, the only text editor available to you is VI in many cases. And I really don't know how to use VI. <laughs> right? So I'm going to uh, choose Vim. Now, if you don't want Vim or have no need for Vim, you're comfortable with VI, uh, that's fine. Now we need to select our default window manager for the X server. Now we only installed one desktop environment, remember? Uh, so KDE is going to be the default because that's the one we installed. Uh, if you wanted to install something else like Fluxbox, Blackbox, Window Maker, uh, Tom's Window Manager, which is the default XORG window manager, it's very basic. Right? It's uh, not really a great experience. I'm going to go with KDE Plasma for my defaults. Then it's warning us that there's no root password set. Remember, we logged in as root, but we didn't have to enter a password. Let's go ahead and set a password for the root user. So I'm going to create a strong and complicated password for the root user and then confirm that strong and complicated password. And then press enter to continue. 
system configuration and installation is complete, you may now reboot your system. So I'm going to hit OK, and then it gets us back to the very first screen of the Incurses installer. Just go to Exit and remove the installation disk. So in my case, I would remove the CD or DVD or if USB stick, whatever you're installing from, remove that, then hit OK to reboot your machine. And it rebooted just fine. And this is Lilo here, this uh, boot screen here. We have two minutes to do something here. If we don't do anything in two minutes, it will automatically boot. Just hit enter to go ahead and finish the boot process. And we come to our login prompt, slackvert is the host name of the computer, login. Now there's only one user. We never created a user that wasn't root. So all you can do is log in as root right now. So log in as root, then enter the root password you created. And now you're logged in root at slackvert in my case. And now what do we want to do? Well, we want to launch KDE Plasma. So we need to start Xorg, the X server. How do you do that from the command line? Well, you simply run the command start X, all one word. And if everything installed correctly, which it did, we have a graphical environment and give it a few seconds. And now we are inside KDE Plasma. Let me go ahead, change the screen resolution. So let me search for display, display configuration and make this 1920 by 1080. Hit apply and keep those changes. So this is Plasma 5.23.5. Again, this is the 25th anniversary of Plasma. So really nice desktop environment. It's a welcome upgrade from KDE 4 from six years ago that Slackware was stuck on forever. And I'm not going to go through all the applications that are installed. It has everything installed, right? It's a big download, a big ISO, and it installs pretty much everything and the kitchen sink. Any kind of program that you want installed is probably already here. The first thing I need to do though, and this is very important, let me go ahead and launch a terminal and let me zoom in so you can see what I'm about to do. We need to actually create a non-root user because right now we logged in to Xorg and to KDE Plasma and the desktop environment as root. Everything we launch is going to have root privileges, right? This is very dangerous. You don't want to be logged in to a desktop environment or window manager as root. So let's go ahead and create our home user. So I'm going to do user add uh, dash m dash s uh, dash s is what is our user's default shell. Probably needs to be slash bin slash bash. That's what I would go with on a Linux system. This is the default shell. Probably should be bash. And then space. And then your username that you're creating. I'm going to call my home user DT. And we just created the DT user. Now DT needs to be a member of certain groups. So let's go ahead and do user mod space dash lowercase a capital G. And let's add the DT user to the wheel group. That's the most important one. The wheel group gives me sudo privileges. So if you don't add your user to the wheel group, you cannot use sudo with that user. So add him to wheel and then comma, no spaces between these groups. I'm going to go ahead and add him to audio, comma, uh, video, comma. If I wanted to keep adding to more and more groups, I think those three groups are enough for now for purposes of this video. Space DT is the user I was adding those groups to. And then what I want to do is now that I've added him to the wheel group, he would have sudo permissions if our sudoers file gives the wheel group sudo permissions. By default, it does not. So what you want to do is you actually you want to do vi sudo. What this does, it's, it edits the slash etsy slash sudoers file in a safe way. Um, and when we get into this, yeah, it gives a warning. You must edit this file as vi sudo. It, it tells you to use that specific command instead of just doing vim slash etsy slash sudoers, which I often do on my videos, or nano slash etsy slash sudoers. Again, there's some safety checks that vi sudo performs. So in case you break this file, and this is an important file, right? You really don't want to break it. So that's why you should always run it as vi sudo. Now I'm going to scroll down here until I find a line that starts with wheel, that group right there. You see user privileges, the root user has all privileges. Well, the wheel group, that line is commented out. I'm going to uncomment that because I want everybody in the wheel group to also have all privileges. So let me write 
and quit that. And now we've created our home user called DT. Uh, he has sudo privileges when he invokes sudo. Now let's reboot the machine. Actually, before we reboot the machine, if we re reboot the machine right now, we're going to have to enter start X again to launch KDE Plasma. Wouldn't it be great if we just had a login manager, right? There's one installed. It just doesn't enable it by default. Let's go ahead and enable that. So I'm logged in as root. Uh, so let me go ahead. I'm going to open this in Vim slash Etsy slash init tab. So that's two T's slash Etsy slash init tab. I'm going to hit enter. Uh, uh, we have some run levels here. You see zero through six. And the default here for the default run level is three. Now run level four actually defaults to uh, session managers, login managers. For example, SDDM, which is the login manager for KDE Plasma. So let's change three to four there. And then write and quit. And now let's reboot and see what happens. And we get back to the bootloader. And there we go. Instead of a prompt, it automatically starts our SDDM login manager. There's only one user, the DT user, that's the non root user, right? And then let's go ahead and enter our super secure password. Ah, but we can't, <laughs> we didn't create a super secure password for the DT user. Ah, we forgot a step. Well, what you would have to do at this point, you should have changed his password before reboot, but we we can drop down to a TTY and change DT's password. So do Control Alt and then probably F3, F4, F5, one of those F keys on your keyboard to switch to a TTY terminal prompt. Here in this virtual machine, what I'm going to have to do, let me get out of full screen mode. And I can't actually type control alt F3 because it's going to do that on my host machine and not the virtual machine. So I have to do it through a menu system. So I'm going to switch to control alt F3 TTY3. I'm going to log in as root because the root user is going to need to change these permissions. Let me make this full screen again so you can see it. And what we want to do is run the command pass WD for change password. If you don't give it a user, it's going to change the password for the user you're logged in to, which is the root user right now. We want to change the password, though, for my DT user. It's going to ask what DT's new password is. And then it's going to ask us to retype it. And now we have set DT's password. So now let's go back to the TTY that actually started our graphical session, which is on most Linux systems, it's probably going to be a TTY2. It may be TTY7. Let's try TTY2. It's not. So let's go to TTY7. And that is the graphical environment. So let me make that full screen again. And now let me log in with DT's new password. And DT logs in just fine. Once again, I'm going to run the display uh, configuration setup one more time. This will be the last time I should ever have to run this with this virtual machine because it should remember it from now on. Uh, because remember, we didn't actually run this as DT before we were root. But now forevermore, I will always log into this VM as DT, and it will remember DT wants 1920 by 1080 as his screen resolution. So that really covers the installation process for Slackware. Even though it has a graphical installer, it's, a, it's an InCurses installer, which is kind of an old school graphical installer. And you do have to partition your drive manually, right? But it's not that hard. You have to create your user manually. There were a few command line things we had to do there. Add the user to some groups. Uh, create our password for our user and things like that but this isn't really uh, that difficult where slackware gets hard and why a lot of new users uh, avoid slackware right it's seen as more of an advanced kind of uh, distro right it's for a power user it's because slackware doesn't really have traditional package management like a package manager that's going to install software for you and manage all your dependencies and things like that. It's, uh, you know, back in the day when Slackware was created, package managers weren't a thing. Dependency management wasn't a thing. And they've just kind of stuck to some of those old ways where Every other distro obviously has moved on past that point. Now, they do have some scripts installed that help you update the system and install packages. You have to go get packages off the Internet. Uh, Slackware packages are tar uh, GZ files, I believe. They're, they're tar balls that essentially you do a standard configure make sudo make install, but they have some scripts that help 
you know, automate the process a little bit. I believe the most common one is slack package slack PKG. If I just run that command and nothing happens, command not found. Well, it's there, but you can't be your regular user, your home user. You need to switch over to the root user. And now if I do slack PKG, it's going to complain that you had to add some options to it. And the first option I would do is slack package update. And I believe that updates like the uh, uh, change logs. You know, it'll go out and find if there's new versions for the packages you already have installed available. And of course, it's going to complain because we haven't selected a mirror. So you, you, there's a lot of steps involved, right? It doesn't automatically uh, select a mirror for you. You have to go and select one. It even gives you the file that you need to edit in case you didn't know it automatically. So I'm going to go ahead and let's just go ahead and do a copy and paste right here. And I'm going to open that in Vim. So this is the Slackware mirror list, and it's going to be long, and it's going to be really in two sections. The first section, Slackware 64 15.0. So this is for Slackware's latest stable release, 15.0. And this is what I'm going to stick with. So I'm going to find a mirror for Slackware stable. So I'm going to scroll down here to the US mirrors, and I'm just going to uncomment one of the mirrors and it has to be one mirror exactly one mirror because remember the warning at the command line told us that if you were paying attention now I, I told you this uh, mirror list is in two parts now that we've got to the end which was the USA mirrors now we have a new list slackware 64 dash current so the current branch you can think of as a more of a rolling release more of an unstable branch so this is what most Slackware users are probably using these days is because the old 14.2 release from six years ago is so old, a lot of users have had to move over to the current branch to just have up to date packages. You know, six years is a long time. But because the stable release was just released yesterday, I'm going to stay on Slackware 15.0. So I'm going to go ahead and write and quit. Now I'm going to up arrow back to the Slack package update. And now, yeah, it should go ahead and find all the changes. And now that it's written all of that to the change log, now we can do slack package space upgrade dash all, I believe is the name of the command. And it says looking for packages to upgrade. Please wait. Done. No packages. So either there's no packages to upgrade or maybe I didn't do that right. I am not a Slackware expert. I actually don't play with Slackware that much. But let's see if I can get some uh, help information here. Let's see what the options were. So we did update. Yeah, upgrade dash all was it. So that was the correct command. Again, this was just released yesterday. It was probably a situation where there was just nothing to upgrade. Now, what if you want to install new software? Well, you see the command install new, right? So slack package install dash new. Well, you can't just do slack package install dash new name of program. Maybe I want to install SM player, a video player, right? It's a uh, says it's looking for new packages to install, please wait. And it did actually find some packages available for install, but these are not SM Player. These are some XFCE packages, Thunar and various XFCE stuff, mouse pad, which is the XFCE uh, text editor. Remember, uh, XFCE was one of the default desktop environments that it was going to install. So I don't know if I still have uh, the ISO attached or still available to install some of those base packages. But it didn't find SM Player, right? Because this is not a traditional kind of package manager where it's going to go search a repository of software, find that name, SM Player, and install that package. We actually need to go get the package itself and download it first. So let me actually minimize that terminal and let's open up a web browser it's Firefox installed yes and let me make that full screen what you want to do is go to pkgspackages.org and you see packages for Linux and Unix and you've got you know lots of distributions including Slackware 15.0 don't click on that just search for something and they give you an example M player uh, that's an example because it doesn't have a lot of dependencies neither does SM player which is very similar to M player let's search for that and here are our results we need to go down to the results for Slackware and there are no results actually for Slackware 15.0 
there is results for Slackware current, but we're not using the current mirrors. Uh, let's just do standard in player. I'd like to find something that is available for 15.0. But again, 15.0 was just released. Uh, yeah, it is available. So there is in player. And what you want to do is click on the .txz file. So this is an archive, right? Click on that. You'll go to this page where you'll get a description. It'll tell you about dependencies. It'll tell you required by, if it's a requirement for other packages. But really, what you want to do is you want to actually just download that file. There is the address. And I'm just going to open link in new tab. And then save that file. It'll save it by default to the downloads directory. Let me go back to the in player page here at packages.org and it actually gives you the installation instructions. It tells you download that txz file, which we've already done, and then as root, enter this command in the terminal, the upgrade package command here. I'm actually going to copy that. <laughs> that will save me from typing. And then I'm going to go ahead and minimize the browser. Let's unminimize that terminal clear the screen there and what I'm going to do is I'm going to CD into the downloads directory if I do a ls there is the mplayer.txz file so all I need to do here is paste that command that we got from their website upgrade package space dash dash install dash new space and then the name of the txz file and I'm going to hit enter and it's going to uh, bypass installing it because it's already installed so <laughs> there's nothing to do but that's how that would work if it was something that wasn't already installed I actually didn't know in player was already here if I go to the menu system and type yeah in player <laughs> in player is already there so that's really all I wanted to do here for this cursory look of Slackware. Before I go, one thing I will quickly do, people are going to want to know about the kernel version. We're on kernel 5.15.19. And if I do HTOP, for those wondering about system resource usage here in KDE Plasma on Slackware, that is very nice. So the full KDE Plasma desktop environment is using 571 megs of RAM of the 6 gigs of RAM I gave this VM. And that's really, really good. And it's using almost no CPU, but that's to be expected. We're not doing anything that should require any CPU. So that is a first look at Slackware 15.0, their latest stable release. Again, it's a very big deal because these things, they don't come around very often. People like to say that Debian is slow with its releases. You know, Debian will release something, you know, every two to three years. You know, we waited six years for this release. Some people were wondering if it was ever going to be released, but here it is. I hope you guys try it out. And for those of you that want to support Slackware, they do have a Patreon. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank the producers of this episode. I need to thank my highest tiered patrons, Devin, Gabe, James, Matt, Michael, Mitchell, Paul, Scott, West, Alan, Chuck, Commander, Angry, Diokai, Dylan, George, Lee, Linux, Ninja, Maxim, Micah, Jan, Alexander, Peace, Arch, and Fedora, Polytech, Red Prophet, Stephen, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without them, the show wouldn't be possible. The show also wouldn't be possible without each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now, these are all my supporters over on Patreon because I don't have any corporate sponsors. I'm just sponsored by you guys, the community. If you guys like videos about Linux and free and open source software and want to support my work, please subscribe to DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace. 16.0 should be out in 2028.